This is from Elder Bednar. He said this. He says, there is no physical pain, no anguish of soul, no infirmity or weakness that you or I ever experienced during our mortal journey that the Savior did not experience first. You and I, in a moment of weakness, may cry out, no one understands me, no one knows. No human being perhaps knows, but the Son of God perfectly knows and understands, for he felt and bore our burdens before we ever did. And because he paid the ultimate price and bore that burden, he has perfect empathy and can extend to us his arm of mercy in so many phases of our life. He can reach out, touch, and succor, literally run to us and strengthen us to be more than we could ever be and help us do more, help us do that which we can never do through relying on our own power. I think too many times we forget the power of our Savior in helping us to accomplish the things we need. Okay, questions on where we are? We, thoughts on, on questions on kind of insurance basics and life insurance? Realize, oh, <laughs> Drew, thank you. Realize that um, insurance, especially cash value life insurance, is extremely complex and detailed. Um, the, the fees are high because there's a, lot, there's a lot that goes into it, lots of moving parts. So be re very careful um, as you're thinking about cash value or permanent insurance. My view is, uh, my view is that uh, if you filled all of your, <laughs> your Ross and your 401ks, you filled all your individual IRAs, and you still need uh, want tax advantage uh, or tax deferred growth, you might think about it. But realize those things are for the life. And, and when little things come up, uh, that's what happens. Um, that piece of research that showed uh, five billion is lost every year from people who start a cash value product and then later sell. In fact, if you want something fun, go look to the insurance companies that sell these products and look at what percent of their revenues our penalty fees for you know, uh, people turning it in. Here's the role, we actually found it. It was just under, in one of my areas there too. So, let's talk about, um, again, we're continuing on with insurance. Um, today we're gonna talk about health, uh, auto, uh, auto long-term care, a little bit about disability. Yes? So I have a question about life insurance. How did the life insurance agents get paid? Are they incentivized to sell you whole life insurance or? I, I had this fun conversation just on Monday and I was asking the, the insurance guy. He says, no, it doesn't come out of your pocket at all. You don't pay me a cent in fees. I said, how much does the insurance company pay you to sell the product? Oh, that's a different story. <laughs> Realize, especially with cash value products, the, um, the agent can receive anywhere from 100 to 150% of your first year commissions. So if you pay $2,000 in first year commissions on your, uh, on your uh, cash value product, he can get up to $3,000. Now, does it really seem like a good product? And, and, it is a good product and do what it does. Cash value life insurance, about 98% of it used for estate planning purposes. It's used to make sure that you know, one, partner, one partner dies, the other partner can continue to run the business. So there's lots of uses for it. It's just not in the investing side like so many push it for. So um, ask your question again. Um, just how their, how their pay structure would like if, if they get more for a cash value life insurance. They do significantly more, or? right. And so really, from my understanding, uh, someone who, who sells a term policy will get um, you know, five to 7% of that commission, first year commission. Um, when they do sell a cash value product, it can be 100 to 150%. And they can get a certain amount for the next five years as well. So there's significant cash incentive to sell those products. And so that's why I always encourage people to follow the money, because it means, it means a lot more. Okay. Um, in order for you guys to get insurance, do you think the insurance company just looks at your name and then just says, okay, runs a credit report on you and then decides whether they take you on? They actually don't. They, they actually pull what's called a comprehensive liability underwriting exchange. Uh, what this place is, it's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a um, 
credit report for all of your insurance claims. Would you like to know what's on those claims? And should you know what's on those claims, especially if you're considering moving from one insurance carrier to another? Because insurance carriers don't have to take you on as a customer. If they think you're high risk, they'll, they just, they'll just decline. So um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pull up, uh, I'd like you to go through, it used to be that you could get this online and you could immediately see it. But what I'd like each of you to do is I'd like you to uh, request it. So can I get a volunteer to, to do this? Jen, you want to come up and do this? Yeah. Good news is no one's going to see anything, but we're just going to have you take it through it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to come here, we're going to do fact act disclosure reports and you'd like a copy of the insurance report. Everyone's going to have to do it here. About a third of you won't have anything on it at all. So you'll just say there was nothing on the, the it. I don't, personal information or uh, insurance? insurance report. Okay. And then we'd like to order options, both reports. Now, if, you were, if you've never been in an accident or you've never owned a home, you won't be on either of these reports. But that's all right, I'd like you to understand these reports because this is what an insurance company will look at before they decide to take you on. So email address. Now you probably don't want to know. Uh, email next is click on there and you click on continue. And then what it's going to do, it's going to, I'm going to cancel this out. It's going to ask you questions. You're going to fill out the same thing again. Social Security number 217-984132. So, so while she's putting that through, then in addition, it's going to ask you four questions too about those. And you, so not only you have to put the information in right, but you have to answer the questions right. And then if they do that, then they say, okay, we will send it to you in 15 days. But while she's doing that, I'm going to just add, it's an article called, Before You're Choosing Your Health Plan, Seven Key Questions to Ask. So question number one, what's the real bottom line? As you're thinking about health insurance, a lot of people think the real bottom line is just the premium. How much is the premium I have to pay? And this says annual premiums aren't the whole story. There's a deductible before benefits kick in. Make sure you understand how it works. Realize an increasing number, you've got this co-pays as well. I went with my dad to a Blue Cross Blue Shield and in about two hours, we had $125 in co-pays, five different co-pays for each of the different places we went. So make sure you understand that. Also take into account, uh, what's the bottom line for medicines? Last year, my wife and I decided, hey, we're empty nesters, so we got a, an easier, we thought we'll just take a, a less uh, detailed plan. And the interesting thing was it, it, we paid significantly more in the medicines we paid as well. So we later went back. Number two, how are you protected from catastrophic costs? Um, thankfully, a lot of this was, uh, uh, now the, the, it, with Obamacare, the catastrophic cost li limit is increased. At one point, you could have a, an insurance plan with a maximum of 100,000. You have a premature child and you can go through that 100,000 in, in you know, three to four days. Number three, will you be able to use your regular doctors? Call the plans that you're considering for a list of participating providers or ask your employer's benefits manager. Since many MDs accept a range of plans, you may be able to continue with your current doctors at no cost. In our case, we had one doctor we really liked and they were not in a plan, but we were able to get them added to the plan and we were able to continue with them there. Four, how complicated is it to see an, a specialist? If you have an HMO, it's the least expensive and most restrictive. Their, their doctor is actually a gatekeeper there. And you have to convince the doctor you need a specialist before they'll allow you to see that. In a PPO, um, you're normally free to consult any specialist in the plan without getting authorization. However, if you see someone who's out of plan, you know, the, the rates are different. Number five, do you have a choice of hospitals? There's nothing worse than having a hospital two miles from your house and you have to go 30 miles because that's the hospital that's, that's covered by, by your plan. <laughs> so we lived... We lived uh, three miles from a hospital in Walnut Creek and thankfully it was covered in our plan. Number six, are the prescriptions covered? You know, most plans have a formulary. 
of prescription drugs it covers. As long as it's on the formula, it's a reduced cost. When it gets into the other drugs, it can be significantly more. So be aware, because they'll cost. Last year when we had the uh, cheaper plan, I think our, our drugs were like, and I have, I have heart medicine drugs, and high blood pressure and cholesterol. I'm pretty consistent with people my age. And it was like 30 or 40 bucks. And when we went on the regular plan, it was like five bucks. So, so be aware. And then number seven, what other benefits are included? Other plans might have health care and vision and dental. So be aware as you look at the plans what they cover because it can have a significant impact. Okay, I'm going to put this up here. Okay, I, I don't have my, I have my social security, but I don't have my driver's license. So <laughs> That's right. You know, so, so, anyway. But this is what you'll do. You'll actually go on there, you'll fill it out, you'll submit it, and it'll actually come and it'll say that, okay, we will send, mail it to you within 15 days. And so what I'm going to show you is what you might get mailed. I think you, you're fine. Sorry. Jenny, thank you. You're fine. So one day I don't have my first <laughs> And this is what you'll get in the mail. Okay, Brian Sedwicks. <laughs> Notice, 11 claims reported. And I, I got this in December. So here's another one here, mid-century insurance, uh, November 4th, 2017. Jeep Patriot, remember we told you about my daughter who told me the Jeep Patriot? That was this one here. Um, it's funny on this one, they don't, they don't tell, oh well. Oh, it paid out, you can see. So they paid out about, about $11,000 on that claim. There's more stuff here. For, 2000, Ford Explorer, no disposition reported. Uh, Ford Truck Expedition, <laughs> all of these things. So, again, when you've got 11 things, do you think, we're, do you think people are going to really want to have us be a... <laughs> we're not on the high list of, of these insurance companies. But what it does is it gives you an idea of what's available um, or, or what insurance company will see when they're considering you for, um, to take you on as a client. Is it important that you understand this? Yes. Um, there's two different reports. One's a five-year lost history for your auto, and another one's a five-year lost history for your homeowners. We purposely have kicked our homeowner's insurance, our deductibles, like $3,000. Why? In 20 years, we've never made a claim on our homeowner's insurance. What happens if you make too many claims and too many small claims? They can kick you off, and they don't have to, uh, they don't have to insure you. So I, I realize there's, there's kind of a balance there that you need to, need to find here. And if you're, um, if your emergency fund is sufficient, you can have significantly high uh, uh, deductibles on your insurance. So I just encourage you to be wise in the things that you do here. Um, when it comes to when it comes to deciding which insurance you want, how do you decide? How do you decide on health insurance? Again, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, to make it easier for you, just print it off this sheet, plus also the one on homeowner's insurance, so you guys kind of take a look at that. But, but each of you have to come up with this, a strategy on how are you going to get the health insurance coverage that you need. Because it's really important. And, and the cost can be prohibitive if, if, uh, if your health turns bad. So, so what are some of your plans and strategies? Well, in fact, let's start it.
So what are some strategies you can use to reduce your health care costs? Ginny. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, he works for Deloitte. And so we always have these conversations like, what do you do? Do you just do a normal insurance plan or do you just do like a catastrophic insurance plan? Like when you have kids, um, you're in the hospital, or not in the hospital, you're in the doctor's office a lot. A lot. So, so kids. And as they get older, they're not, their immune systems build up and you're not there quite so much. So when they're little, you want something that's going to, you know, you're that's going to have like low co pays when you're going to the doctor. Um, that's going to hopefully low co pays on your medication. Right? Okay. Go work for the government. You don't get paid a whole lot, but you got pretty decent insurance. Okay. Co pays are low. Um, but then you balance that with when they're older and you're not going very much, you, you're still paying kind of a lot. So, my, what my brother in law talks about doing is just going, switching over to a catastrophic. So. The issue there is then your deductibles are really high, um, or maybe your co-pays are higher, um, but then but your insurance premiums are lower. So that's the trade-off. Okay, is there a strategy? <laughs> She's actually talking about a strategy here. Should we have a strategy on our on our health insurance? So what are just some things you can do to reduce your costs? You can do an HSA. What's a health savings account? It's a high deductible health plan. And then you put certain amount, amounts of money tax, tax free, or it, it, it money's already been taxed, but you, you don't pay taxes on it. And then when you use it to pay for medical expenses, it's not taxed at all. Also, what happens at age 59 and a half? You can actually use it for retirement. Okay, are, there, are there like uh, maximums? There are maximums there too. But does it like roll over every year? Yeah, it does. Now, what's the difference between that and a flexible spending account? My DMBB Blue Benny card. Does this one roll over every year? No. no, it doesn't. I either use it, I lose it. I went to pay for some medicines last week and we've already used the $2,500 we put up at the beginning too. So the nice thing is I'm, I spent money before I had it, before they'd actually taken that out. So that's kind of an interesting thing there too. What's better, like what's better you, you can have both. So a, a flexible spending is something that comes with your insurance company. Here's the question. If you decide to do a health savings account, can your company contribute toward your health savings account? Do really well. And some do, and some do really well too, really? as Nathan just said here. And you so, think of that when you're getting a job, you, you, and you're accountants, you guys know this, but you really have to, those benefits make a huge difference. Yeah, it can so be 30 to 40. you compare job offers, you want to compare benefits and yeah. income. Nathan. I was going to say, to, to kind of help this question as well, a lot of it will depend on what type of plan it is. For BYU, for instance, because I have a spouse who works at BYU, they have an FSA because their insurance is already really, really good. And if there was an HSA on top of it, it'd be kind of you know crazy because an HSA has more flexibility to it and what you're able to do, and, and that money rolls over. So often, if you go to an employer that has a high deductible plan or other things, they might have an HSA with some match. Mm -hmm. um, so personally, to answer this question, in my opinion, if you have an option, I would choose an HSA. However, you know, I think it's just going to So the key is we need to take responsibility for our health care as much as we can. Um, here's just some thoughts. Uh, best methods of controlling health care costs. <laughs> Run. Exercise. <laughs> Use a group plan. <laughs> Medical reimbursement or flexible spending. Consider what's COBRA? COBRA is a plan once you lose your job or you quit, you, you can go up to six months on it and you have to pay the entire cost. It's quite expensive, but between working with Montgomery Asset Management and coming here to BYU, I went on COBRA for four months. Uh, it still gives you that thing too. And what happens if both you and your spouse work and both you and your spouse have health plans? Do, do you have to buy insurance from both one? You can actually just have the insurance on one and sometimes they'll even give you a rebate because you don't pay the insurance on the other one there too. So here's just a couple of other things. Additional, compare rates. Number two, protect yourself from the catastrophic things. Those are really the, the big things there. Individual policy, if you're not covered at work, consider a high deductible health plan. Okay. 
So what's our plan for students? What we've done here is I've kind of divided it out. What about students and young marrieds and you know, <laughs> families and then empty nesters? And I think as, as Ginny said, that plan will change over time. It's not one plan that you'll keep for the, your life. So most of you aren't, are over 26. So if you're under 26, what's kind of the recommended thing? Stay yeah, stay on your parents' plan. <laughs> How many people here are on their parents' plan? Good chunk of you too. So other strategies that you would have? Here's just some thoughts. No parents' insurance, you can be in BYU insurance. If you're not on your parents' insurance, that's generally what I tell people to do. First start with your parents' insurance. Then if you're not, once you have to get kicked off of that, you have to go to, your, uh, go to an HSA. So my son just turned 26 or 27. So he's uh, moving in that direction now. <laughs> so we, we had this discussion. And really keep your emergency fund high to, for uh, immediate needs. How about young marrieds? How about before you have kids? What's, what's probably a good thing? You're over 26. Yeah, you could probably do your HSA. Do HSA or a, you know, a valuable plan, yeah. like a value style plan, if mm -hmm. you're healthy enough, you don't mm -hmm. have any issues. Okay. Then what happens once kids come and kids seem to be in the, the doctor's office a lot? You know, I remember my mom telling me one story. There was, this is one, one summer I had, had like three sets of stitches because I, I used to get in trouble. And, the doctor turned to my mom and said, Mrs. Sudweeks, what are you doing to this kid? <laughs> so, but things, other things. If you're still on your parents' insurance, ensure the parents' cover, insurance covers pregnancy. Deductible maybe per person or realize that the, the child is a person. Low, you might be eligible for Medicaid. Um, you know, and if you've got those, if you've got these government benefits, use them. I remember I, uh, I was, lost my job and I was let go. And I was thinking, I don't, I'm not going to go to unemployment insurance. You know, I don't have to do that. And after about three weeks, I thought, wait a second, I paid into this. Those are benefits I deserve. And so I went and signed up for it. But realize, these are benefits to help you. Um, generally, what we found in our family is once children come, a traditional plan is a little bit better. Um, and a, again, a traditional plan with a doctor that you really like is especially, especially good. And then if you've got that flexible spending plan, that's only set up by your, your company and your insurance companies. Um, if you've got one of those, it, it's, a, it's a good deal. Um, and then you just have to be wise and make sure you use it. Like I said, right now, uh, we, we'll use, we, we, just the two of us, we use a significant amount. And we've already spent the amount for this year and we still have you know, three more months left. How about married with families? What would, you be, what would your strategy be here? Carlos, what, what's your strategy? Uh, I kept the DMBA. DMBA? OK. I got those polar kids, and they, uh, that's the deal. OK, so, so which is more a traditional plan, and you get, yeah. to, you get to pick. And actually, DMBA insurance is quite good. I mean, that's my, my life, wife and I like what we have here. But here's just some ideas, too. Review it annually. You continue to use that flexible spending plan. How about when you get to be? Empty nesters like me. And you know what? Those are times to change. Well, we changed it last year, and then we found, hey, it was costing us more money, so we switched back. So we're still more of a traditional plan. Um, but, but the key here is I want you guys to think through it. You've got that sheet of paper that actually has the different types of plans. And there are benefits. There's advantages and disadvantages of each of those types of plans. So there's not a one type of in uh, health insurance that will last you throughout your life. So we need to be strategic as we put that together. Now, I'm not going to talk much about disability insurance, but let me just give you some ideas on some strategy. Um, disability, if you're going to get it, if you can look to company provided disability, it's a lot cheaper than uh, going outside. Um, because of the high cost of short-term disability insurance, you know, you might want to think kick your emergency bond up to four to five, maybe even to six months. That way you, could, you have the, the, the resources there <laughs> until Social Security disability or workers' compensation is available. And then longer term disability, I'd probably go through something like Social Security, things like that. And then long term care insurance, this is just really expensive. 
Um, there used to be a lot of firms that offered this and then they found out how expensive it was and so they pulled back the number of long-term care insurance. Um, Yeah, it can be expensive. So realize, just continue to save that 20%, invest it wisely, so you'll have the resources should you need it. Okay, that, this is the extent of what I'm gonna do when I'm talking about health insurance, so basically health, long-term care, disability. A lot more good stuff in the readings. I uh, encourage you to do the readings sometime. It's, <coughs> I can be a lot more detailed in the reading than I can in the PowerPoints, because the PowerPoints I try to limit myself to like 50 slides. <laughs> But if you want to go into more detail, I encourage you to, to go in the reading side. Okay. I just have one. Yes? I just want to add one thing real quick on health insurance. It's important if you have specific needs to know what insurances are and are not required to cover and to what ages. Okay. So my wife works with children with disabilities and some insurances will cover like disability services like kids with autism and Down syndrome. Like that will only go to a certain age as required by law. Some insurances go far beyond that. And I mean, it's the difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars before the child turns 18, depending on what type of insurance you have. Okay, so, uh, so where would you find this information? Just in the, in the insurance documents? Yeah, look in the insurance document, look what your, wherever you work, because states also have different things if you're covered uh -huh. by Medicaid. Okay. Um, check with local laws and okay. Yeah, don't be passive in this. Take responsibility for your, your medical expenses. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to asset protection, maybe automobile. I'm gonna start with four stories. Number one, my wife and I, we moved from, from Washington DC to San Francisco. We lived in Walnut Creek. And we had, I can't remember, four or five kids at this time. We decided, hey, it's time, we're close to the place. We wanna teach our kids to ski. Now, neither of us are very good skiers, but uh, my wife get, gets a season pass every year, and I'm excited because next year I get my $175 senior pass at Sundance. <laughs> so we're excited about that, but I think we had like six kids. Um, realized we had, a, I bought from my sister and her husband, I bought their extent, a GMC extended van. So in, way back then it had a pop-up top, it had a little VCR with a TV in it, you know, and it, back then it was really cool. My kids loved it. It had, instead of the normal seats there, they had two seats, one folded down into a twin bed and one folded into a queen bed. <laughs> so, you know, when things get through, you put the beds down, the kids just bounce all they want. Um, but so we, we were going up to a place called Ta Tahoe Daughter. It's off of I-80. It's a nice, it's a, it's a family ski resort. Anyone been to Tahoe Daughter before? I guess I can say anything one, one about it. No, but it's, 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 it's not as big as Sundance. It's just a small kind of a family-centered one. We thought that would be a good one uh, for us to go. Um, we came off, off the freeway. It goes across here. And then the, the cabin was right up here. And then there was a hill here. And also we knew because we had been there before, there was another road here. So uh, we weren't that concerned. It was snowing, snowing lightly, um, but, but it was fun. Uh, in addition to the long wheelbase van, I had a trailer on the back that had all the, all the ski stuff, all the baby stuff. You know, <laughs> some of you who have kids, you know, it's quite a, quite a lot to take a lot with the kids. And you know, with six kids, it was kind of a kind of thing. So we came off here, it was snowing, icy, realized we're up in the mountains. We came through and we turned up here and I got up about, about 100 feet and all of a sudden my tires, it was, on, it was on ice and my tires start spinning. So I go, no problem. You know, I'm a, I'm a prepared, I'm a Boy Scout, I'm prepared. So I went and got my chains, I put my chains on it and <laughs> got in the car I expected to, to go for and put it in drive and I drove, I drove about six feet and the tires just started spinning. And I'm just going, oh no, this is not fun. Uh, so I said, okay. You know, so I started backing down and you get these cars coming by and I got the look, every time these guys look at me, you know, and I'm in this big honking minivan, or <laughs> full, full van, and they give me that look, the California, oh, we can tell you're from the Bay Area, you don't know how to drive in this stuff, you poor sucker. It's kind of the same look the Utahns give the California drivers here on the first snow. So you guys kind of know of that. Um, how is backing up a long wheelbase vehicle with a short wheelbase trailer, is it easy? 
No, it's not fun at all. But, but what I found out is because we were on ice, I could back up until I'd almost jackknife, and then I could actually go and just shove the trailer over and then I'd go back and back up. So <laughs> you can tell how good I am at backing things up. But what I noticed is there was this road here, and I thought, well, if I back up here, put the trailer here, and then I can turn. And, you know, I get three or four more people drive by, just kind of the, you know, you dumb sucker look. You, know, you guys know what that look is. And then, <laughs> so we we're almost ready. I'm getting ready to, the trailer's kind of moving into this area, and I see this red forerunner coming over the hill. And he's going way fast. And I just screamed, hold on. <laughs> And the three-year-old was behind my wife, the cabin's chair, and she just took her hands like this and just grabbed the cabin's chair like that. And I just watched as the forerunner locked up his brakes, slid right into me, and I can still see the airbag exploding in my mind's eye. And thankfully, because we're on ice, instead of forcing us to roll, which, it, which, would, have, you know, which would have been really bad because my kids weren't buckled in at that time, it just shoved us back. And so we got our cell phone in that case was, was about this big, you know, plugged into the thing here and we called the police. And, um, you know, 45 minutes later they come out because there was lots of accidents that day. And so we find Mr. Sudwick's coming to get in the car with me. So he asked me, Mr. Sudwick, how fast were you going? And I says, well, I was backing up. I was only doing like one, mi one mile per hour. I says, you know how, how poor of a backup driver I am. So the other guy says, Mr. Mr. Smith, whatever his name, how fast were you going? He says, well, I was only going like five miles an hour. And I didn't say a thing. I didn't say that it was a half dozen other people who came by and drove right around me without a problem. I didn't say, hey, if you're only going five miles an hour, how come the airbags exploded? <laughs> I didn't say a single thing. And you know what happened? So we got a rental, a rental vehicle, put a trailer hitch on it, towed the, towed the trailer back. About three weeks later, I got, an e I got a, a note in the mail from the... the Wonderful California Highway Department. It says, you know, Mr. Sedwick, we reviewed the accident. You're both at fault. But Mr. Sedwick, you are 51% at fault, and this other guy's 49% at fault. No. So guess whose insurance company got to pay for both vehicles? Guess whose insurance went up? Guess who paid stupid tax for a while after that? Okay, that's story number one. Definitely say something. <coughs> So we try to tell her, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, of course. And so she goes, well, there's a roundabout as you go into Station Park. And so she's driving around, and bad thing is we told one of the friends that lives with them, like, if, it's, if she drives, it's your fault. So <laughs> she don't say that ever. <laughs> she doesn't jinx herself. Anyway, she's coming around the roundabout, and this car pulls into the roundabout and just slams into the side of them. And the lady gets out, and she yelling at this poor girl me, um, and just telling her it's her fault and luckily anyway so we go over there we were over there too but we come over and 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 the other kids were saying you know it wasn't your fault it wasn't your fault trying to calm her down but anyway they did say you know can we pull we're thinking there's videos because it's station park can we pull the videos but they did the you know the lady tried to blame her and say it was her fault and Yeah. Any information you can put and give them at the scene of the accident. Don't make the mistake that I did. <laughs> Jessica? Um, my cousin was like parked on the side of the street and this person backed out and hit him. So what he did is he pulled out his phone and had it on record and got the other person admitting that was his fault but saying the insurance would never believe that he backed out into that car. And so he just submitted that to the insurance company and they were like, it was going to rule against him. So because he had that recording, uh -huh. the insurance So be, be wise. Phones, be wise here. <laughs> okay. Story number two. <coughs> Eighth East in Orem. You guys know where the old word, word perfect buildings are? 
There's this big open field here, and here's the cemetery field. If any of you play, play soccer. Well, I was coming back. I had Emily and Bre <laughs> Brenna in the car with me. We had just come from, it's called Sunshine Generation. It's four, it's four to eight-year-old kids who sing and dance, and you know, it's really kind of fun. And I was just picking them up after their practice. And I came across this place here. <laughs> and I was going, and I was in my Mustang, and all of a sudden, bam! And my daughter Emily goes, Dad, what did you hit? I don't know why she always says that every time when something happens. And so I kind of pulled over to the side, pulled over to the side and got out of my car. And right in that front right quarter panel, uh, I could see fur. And so I knew what had happened. There was a deer who was coming through here and they timed it just perfect. Perfect, it ran, it hit me. I didn't hit it, it, it hit me. It was coming over to the cemetery field. And about this time, all of a sudden I looked up and there was a policeman over here and he put his lights on and he came behind me. And he, took my license and anything. Mr. Sudby's getting in the car. And I, so I got in the car and all of a sudden I heard, bam! You don't want to be an uninsured motorist in Utah because they shoot them. No, I mean, that's what it <laughs> Put the deer out of its misery. But did I still have to pay the, the deductible of $750 or whatever it was? Yeah, I did. Okay, story number three, Park City. Deer are interesting. Deer are interesting. What's the height of a deer? Last night, or, you know, they're usually the height about this high. What happens if you hit them with a car? You knock them off to the side. How about elk or, elk, elk or moose? Are they this high? They're significantly higher. What happens if you hit an elk or moose? So a good friend of mine, Creed Archibald, he tells me about every year two to three people are killed because they're driving, people are driving these roads and going a little bit too fast. Or the elk or moose just jump right out in front of them. Um, and what happens is they knock the feet back up and, out from under them and the whole body comes into the cockpit part of the car. And so two to three people <laughs> are killed each, each year because of that. Final story. My nephew Jeff and his wife Jamie, they were in their Bronco. They were on their way to Idaho. They stopped by his parents' house in Salt Lake. They had all of their Christmas presents in the back of their car. And they thought, ah, this is a pretty safe neighborhood. We're not too worried about it. So in the morning when they got up, someone had broken into the back of the car and stolen all of their Christmas presents. Would that be covered by auto insurance? Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about each of those. And what's easier to do is, is I'm just gonna bring up some, some overheads. I'm going to bring up some overheads because I think it's, it'll be easier to see. And these are actual... These are actual uh, insurance papers I have. These are older ones, but they make the point, I think, really well. Okay, starting off here. Told you my brother was an insurance agent. You can see his name. Here's the VIN number. What are these rating points? Major, minor accidents. What are rating points? Each time you get a ticket or an accident, are there certain points that go with it? Yeah, and you get too many points, what they can do is they can take your license. How about if you, you have a ticket? Does that have an impact? My wife, a couple of weeks ago, she actually car ahead of went, went ahead and stopped and she actually, all she did was touch the, um, the trailer hitch ball. And the person said, no, you know, call the cops. She didn't, wouldn't even get out of her car and look. My wife got stuck with a $130 ticket just because she touched it. Didn't hurt the other car at all, just hurt our car. <laughs> She's going to traffic school tonight <laughs> to, to do that. Is it important? Yeah. Okay, a couple of other things. Let's talk about coverage. You've got liability coverage. <laughs> Sorry, when it comes to accidents, we all have fun stories. Okay, go ahead. Well, because, yeah, we've had horrible years. But I would say, if you ever get in an accident, always, you know, fight this again. It's not that bad. Yeah. Like, if you get in an accident, always fight this again. It might cost you, like, $30. But the, the, what your insurance will go, you know, it just, it will save you a lot on the back end if you go in and fight it. Because then you can go to, like, traffic school or something. Yeah. I, when I was in 
college when I thought your guys' age, I drove down to Moab and I was coming back. It was luckily I was driving my grandma's car. She's like, I don't want to do so much about this. I'm home with you. And we actually hit gravel and spun and rolled off of Highway 6, rolled down the canyon about 40 feet off, and then rolled. Um, and they gave me a ticket just because, and I went and fought it, and they said that the, <laughs> the courts didn't agree, because if you get in an accident, they automatically give you a ticket, and they're like, well, that, we think that's kind of dumb. So they actually took it off, but yeah. um, they don't always take it off. We've had other yeah. areas where they don't take it off, but it will help you because they'll give you options to help yeah. your insurance. My wife actually went and fought it. She says, this seems insane. So I didn't do any damage to this at all, and I, the ticket's more expensive than what it costs to fix the car. And they said, they said, sorry, you got the ticket. And so she, she yeah, did. So sometimes they don't, but, but then they give you options to yeah. go to, because if not, then you're going to pay that ticket, and they actually tell you that they're going to give you options to the insurance company. Yeah. Yeah. So then they don't give you that ticket. Yeah. 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 Yeah, don't, don't hesitate to fight. Okay, coverages, liability coverage. What's that 250, 500, 100 refer to? It's called split coverage. What's the 250? What does it relate to? That's liability per person. So $250,000 per person. What's the 500? Per accident, and the 100 is property damage per accident here. So if you've got two people and they each have 250,000 in medical experiences, it will cover the first one and it will cover the second up to, up to the limits of 500,000. What do you think Utah State requirements are? <laughs> it is 25, 50, 15. So anyone been in a hospital lately? How many days were you in and what, what, what was your cost? In the previous class, we had someone who was in for four hours, and it was $3,000. So $3,000 times eight. So don't be in the hospital more than 32 hours, or you're going uh, you know, to have to pay all of the costs there, too. $25,000, that was first set up in 1970. Have costs gone up since 1970? Significantly. How about, uh, how about this? Uh, $15,000, how many cars out there can you repair for $15,000? Not even the Hyundai's now. <laughs> Used to be things like that. What happens if you only have state required insurance, 25, 50, 15, and it's a $50,000 car you hit in damage? Who's going to pay for the, uh, the additional $35,000? It will be you. So state requirements are just those. Make sure you do that here. Um, uninsured motorists, what's that? What's uninsured motorist coverage? What percent of the, do you think every motorist in, the, in Utah is insured? Legally, by law, they're supposed to be. But one in five, 20% are not. So what happens if you get hit by one of those? And so you want to make sure you maintain that coverage the same levels as you do before. How about this? What's this medical no fault? It used to be when there was an accident that the insurance companies would be fighting over who has to pay. You have to pay it. No, you have to pay it. And what happened during that time, people were not getting the help they needed. They were sitting in the hospital. Insurance came up and says, okay, we're going to do a medical no fault that we'll pay up to $3,000 just to get people get the help they need. And then once we've done that, then we'll get back together and we'll figure out <coughs> what it was. So they'll pay $3,000 out just to get people the, the help they need. Now, what is this comprehensive? Comprehensive deductible. What is comprehensive? And I'm going to the insurance book here. Someone tell me what comprehensive is. So may, maybe an easier thing, what's collision? When you hit something. <laughs> what's comprehensive? So here's collision. We will pay for loss to your insured car caused by collision less any applicable deductibles. What's comprehensive? We will pay loss to your insured car caused by accidental means except collision 
less any applicable deductives. Loss by missiles, falling objects, fire, theft, larceny, explosion, earthquake, windstorm, hail, water, flood, vandalism, riot, or civil commotion. Colliding with a bird or animal is not deemed lost by collision. So back to my example, the second story when I got hit by the deer. Was that collision or comprehensive? Comprehensive. Did, did that increase the, my insurance costs? Actually, no. Let's go to step B, but what happens, so as much as we love the deer, and I see them all the time, this, yesterday morning we were running, we ran down foothill and we saw deer kind of running up the hill. So as much as we, if you can stop safely before hitting the deer, should you do that? Yeah, but if you can't stop safely, what do you do? As much as we love Bambi, hit the deer. How about, how about the story with the elk? Story number three, elk or moose. What happens if you swerve to avoid the elk or moose and you hit a telephone pole, will that be collision? Yeah, but you'll likely be alive. So if you have the choice of, of being alive and, and increasing your insurance costs or being dead and not having to increase your costs, try to be alive, yeah. Uh-huh. So Maximum for your insurance. But those are also the state. Minimum. No, no. S the state requires you to have a minimum of amount. You could go over that amount, but there is a minimum that the state will not allow you to have insurance below. And those amounts were developed in 1970. So just out of curiosity, what do you, what do you think average inflation has been from 1970? So we're, at, we're almost 50 years. I think in, inflation's been two, two and a half percent, law of 72, so one, one and a half times. So what do I recommend for students? I recommend a minimum on split coverage of 100, 300, 100 to start off. And then as, as you get older, I increase those limits. Um, here's a question too. What happens, let's go to story number four with the Christmas presents. Where, where are those Christmas presents covered? Is it collision or comprehensive? Pardon me? Yeah. So someone said, if you think of this, take your car, pick it up in the air, shake it, and anything that falls out is not covered by car insurance. So where, are, where were those Christmas presents be covered? Yeah, homeowner slash renter's insurance. Do you realize that homeowner slash renter's insurance <coughs> is covered regardless of location? You have your computer stolen here in Provo? You're on your parents' homeowner's and renter's insurance? They can, they can claim that because it's regardless of location. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, minus deductible. And then collision 750. Things like that, yeah. Another question ben. on that. So if you have a bike rack and bikes, uh -huh. you know, they wouldn't fall off the car? That's still that? considered, that, that'd be on your homeowner slash renter's insurance. Okay. Um, what happens if someone runs into the bike rack on the back? Would those be replaced as part of their insurance? I would hope so. It, it should be, yeah. Um, on the uninsured motorist, is it typical that it doesn't cover property damage? Yeah, it is typical. It's just, just the liability side there. Okay, let's look at these costs here. Premium by coverage, 110 for liability, 35 and 86. Now, what are these endorsement numbers? Have you ever heard those endorsement numbers? It's really the insurance company protecting themselves. So here's endorsement E1417. E1417, this says, it is agreed that if a loss to auto safety glass is repaired rather than replaced, the deductible applying to coverage F comprehensive under part four damage to your car is waived. So what the insurance company says, hey, if you, know, if you repair your safety glass instead of replace it, you don't have to pay the deductible. So if you go into my clue report, you'll see a whole bunch of you know, $50 <laughs> glass claims where people say, okay, we'll, we'll repair that there. Um, other ones are um, just different things such as they can repair your car, if it's a GM car, it doesn't have to be GM parts, but it has to be suitable parts uh, and things like that. 
Um, probably one of the most important things, and too many people forget this, is what are your discounts? A accident free, big deal one here. Ultra preferred group, what they found out if you're, an if you're a teacher here, you're just really boring and so the odds of you getting in a wreck are pretty low. You're between age 30 and 60, again, ultra preferred group. You've got passive restraints, you've got airbags, analog brakes, EFT, electronic funds transfer, if you do that, they will um, give you a 5% discount if you, you know. Um, things like multiple cars, so if you have more than one car, if you do it with the same company, they'll give you a discount here. Auto slash home, if you have both auto and homeowner's insurance together, they'll get a discount. And here, if you have auto half home slash life, you'll get a discount here. What about, uh, what about renter's insurance? Is that a good deal? A, how many people have renter's insurance? Ethan, why do you have it? Okay. And we wouldn't be liable for that, but we wouldn't get to replace any of the stuff that we yeah. have. Yeah, you're not reliable for the apartment, but none of the stuff. So realize the apartment insurance is just for that. What happens if he would have had renter's insurance, would that have covered the, uh, the, the loss of the Christmas presents? It would have, after the deductible. So the other thing that's pretty cool is renter's insurance. If you get the renter's insurance from the same person who does your car insurance, I've actually had people who pay less money. They actually made money on the deal because the discount from having uh, multiple, more, multiple policies was more than what the renter's insurance was. So look into that. And the renter's insurance, here's something. If you have kids, let's say your son leaves a skateboard out there and one of the neighborhood kids comes, steps on the skateboard and falls and breaks his arm. They can sue you. They won't sue the apartment place. And if you have liability insurance, that would, that would cover it in that case. Okay, now we're going to compare this to two different vehicles. That's vehicle one. This is vehicle two. This is the teenager's vehicle. Notice same liability limits. What does it mean, NCNC? -E -N -C? Yeah. So that was a 2006 before, this is a 1999. Do you have to have comprehensive and, uh, comprehensive and collision coverage? No. So in this case, what happens if they wreck the car? It stays wrecked. <laughs> My daughter was driving, driving down the street. She got a little bit too close to a U-Haul truck. And you know those big lug nuts on the U-Haul truck? It made this really cool design on the running boards. So what do we do? We just took both the running boards off. <laughs> so notice the things here. Notice the coverage. In the previous one, it was, remember how much it was? It was like 110. How come this is 244? And this vehicle is seven years older. Pardon me? Okay, you've got points up there, accidents. That's part. What's the other thing, too? Yeah, the age of the drivers, too. So realize insurance companies, they will assign a uh, person to each car. As you have teenagers, they tend to assign those to the expensive cars. And so... <laughs> It's a lot more expensive to have teenagers there. Even with the same things, notice here the discounts, good student discount. Make sure your teenagers keep their grades up and make sure they get those good student discounts because those can be substantive. <laughs> so be, be wise in that there too. Um, I think that's about all I wanted to do on that one. Um, how expensive... I told you, our case was she turned 16 on Friday, put her on the insurance on Monday, and told the car on Tuesday. <laughs> so we all have our stories. In fact, Jim Brow and I, we, we always have this competition, whose child did the most damage? So, so after a while, I'm winning, and then after a while, he's winning. And, you know, so Jim and I have a good time at that. I, I wanted to show you how cheap liability insurance coverage is. Remember the, the story about the car that got you know, insurance on Friday, or 16 on Friday, Monday, this is that car. It was a, it's a 2000 Jeep Grand Cherokee. So what we've got on the first column is state requirements, 2550, it's actually 2550, 15. And on the, the 
Third column is 100, 300, 100, which is kind of the minimum I recommend for you right now. And so, notice the difference. Un, uh, BIPD is bodily insurance and property damage. Uninsured motorist, underinsured. PIP is your personal insurance protected. Same comprehensive. What do you notice about the difference between these two plans? How much more coverage do you have on column three than column one? How much more coverage do you have in bod bodily injury? 25 versus 100, so you've got four times. How about per accident? Six times. How about property damage? Six times. And what's the increase in cost? 10 bucks. Is liability insurance cheap? Yeah. So if you need to reduce costs, don't reduce the liability insurance. Keep that high. Reduce things like increase your deductible or things like that. Okay. Let's just talk a little bit about renter's insurance. Just make the final case here. What does renter's insurance include? Personal property, loss of use. Um, my wife, when she was growing up, her younger brother, who was about four or five, decided he wanted to play with candles. And so he took some candles and he went into the closet. And needless to say, it caught some clothes on fire, which later caught the entire house on fire. So for about four months, they were <laughs> living in a hotel room, eating out every night. <laughs> on the insurance from loss of use. But is that, is that something that could happen? Yeah. We talked about that what happens, you know, your son leaves a skateboard, your daughter leaves a skateboard out there. So that personal liability insurance. So, and also too, what about, you know, what happens if there's a, um, a fire there and all of a sudden you lose all your property? You know, your personal property. Would that be nice to have that uh, paid back? Now, a couple of things, one thing I want to know, notice it says contents replacement. What's the difference between them replacing it and con full contents replacement? If you've got a 30-inch TV, you paid $400 for 10 years ago, and they have to replace it, what do you think you're going to get for it now? Not much. But if you have a 30-inch 30, uh, 30 TV and you've got contents replacement, what will they replace it with? A 30-inch TV. So make sure you, on these things that you've got contents replacements, Look how expensive this is, eight bucks a month. But it's important that, you, that, that we understand those things. Oh, okay. What about homeowner's insurance? What about different types of homeowner's insurance? You've got that on that sheet of paper that I handed out. Notice eight types. Now there's a difference here. There's a difference between basic form and broad form insurance. What's basic form insurance? And what basic form says, it says we only cover it if it's listed. So if it's fire, so broad form, it's only covered if it's listed. And then broad, um, broad or com comprehensive forms, which is an open perils basis, that's what you want. Open perils says if it's not excluded, it's covered. So ideally what you want the one, you want the one that has the most coverage. What I recommended for most houses would be an HO5. Uh, HO4 is renters or tenants insurance. Again, notice each of these things, for example, your coverage other structures is a percentage of your dwelling. Notice your personal property is a percentage of your dwelling. And the loss of use is a percentage of your dwelling. So m make sure that you understand that. Um, separate structures. In our house, we have a pool and we also have a gazebo. 
It's not, not connected to the house, but would those be considered separate structures? The answer is yes. So, so realize that, that your coverage covers different things, and most of that stuff is based on the dwelling. Yes? I'm curious about like, the name for all the policies. So are these, like, I mean, there's probably lots of homeowners no. insurance. These, right, so these are, right, huh, but these are the standard policies that people have. So most of you would get an HO5 policy. Now, will that be priced different? with different places, and the answer is yes. It can be priced different depending on a lot of different things, deductible, other things like that, location. Um, and so just, just be aware of the different types of insurance. Um, let's notice here we had the different dwelling, separate, stru separate, stu separate structures, Loss of youth. So here's an example of a policy here. The policy there. Again, guest liability, medical floater. Can you put floaters on your insurance policies? So what's a floater? In our case, my wife had a wedding ring. So the first, if we got married, we, we put a floater on that that would cover the wedding ring. Are, is jewelry included in these policies? Only, only to, a, to a limited amount. So what you can do is you can put riders on these things or floaters that go in addition to the standard policies. So if you've got a lot of very expensive, you know, antique cars, you know, you'd, you'd probably want to put a floater or a rider on that policy to help protect. Again, it's an insurance product. Can they be very creative in what they put there? Yeah, they can. So, so be aware of these things. One more thing. How about? Pardon me. They're not. Sorry. But if if you want, we can make them available. So, what's an umbrella policy? Any of you guys heard of an umbrella policy? What does it sound like? Consolidate. Yeah, it consolidates. Now, will a company do an umbrella if the, the lower level things are, are not with their company? No, they'll only do an umbrella for their policies. So in this case here, what we have is things like residents and motorized vehicles, uninsured slash underinsured motorists, youthful drivers, Unlicensed recreational vehicles, <laughs> scary things. But what happens? So what happens if someone's off riding an a uh, ATV and they hit someone, hit another kid, or so one of their friends are on the back and they fall off? Are the liability, or is, is the opportunity for lawsuits pretty high? Yeah, it is. And so once your asset size grows and you're <laughs> you have more teenagers, an umbrella might be interesting. So what we did is, Notice each of these are with, with farmer's insurance. Notice it's the $500 limit on each of them. So even my Suzuki 80, which is a little tiny yellow thing that we've had for since, you know, it's only, it's only 18 years old. I've got $500,000 of liability insurance on it. You know, but, but each of those things, so we have that maximum coverage on each of those. And then what we do is we have this liability coverage that says, hey, what, what if someone gets hurt and they sue us? You've got, you've got a, it, the little Suzuki will be up to, it's 500,000, and then beyond that, the umbrella will take it up there. Um, we wanna be careful, again, we, we insure against catastrophic events, and if someone coming to sue you to uh, take away all this hard-earned stuff, that's a pretty catastrophic event. Okay, so what, what kind of strategy should we have well let's talk how do we reduce how do we reduce our homeowners costs how do you keep your homeowners costs down is that something we're going to be con want to be concerned about? Nathan, you concerned about it with your home right now? Well, I, if I have one. <laughs> okay. Have, yeah. It's yeah. Important. You can lower it by just having not as expensive a home. 
Yeah, you can lower it by just not having as expensive a home. And again, my two big mistakes here, getting a dog and <laughs> having too big of a house. But, but the point here is, um, how do we lower those costs? Thoughts? Because we've got two things, how do you lower the costs? And number two, what should your strategy be? So here's some thoughts. Number one, know your needs. Again, you want guaranteed full replacement cost. That way, it, the house is re rebuilt regardless of what you paid for it. Um, if you've got certain things you have need extra coverage, don't hesitate to add riders. Uh, if you're concerned about floods or earthquakes, don't hesitate to ride those there too. Um, extra coverage or floater policy, really just for high value added stuff. Number two, don't underinsure. What happens, there's a thing called the 80% rule. If you don't insure for at least 80% of the value of the home, you will actually receive the greater of the cash value of the loss or the insurance coverage divided by 80% times the value of the loss. So make sure you don't underinsure. Shop around, get good places. I'm amazed at the differences in, in uh, insurance costs. Really different insurance companies price risk differently. So make sure you understand that there. Get your clue report. <laughs> make sure you review that because that is what the insurance companies will see before they work with you. <laughs> Use all the saving methods that you can. Um, <laughs> drop the coverage for small clients. We added security systems. It really wasn't worried about people coming in. It was actually keeping our kids from going out. So that's why we put the security system is. And then know your coverage. Realize the amount that they pay will not exceed the limits on the coverage. And then the last one, just make it work. I would recommend that every year you just take a videotape and you just walk through the house. And open all the doors, open all the drawers, just continue videotaping. It's going to be a real boring 30 minutes, but it will, uh, in case there's a problem. And then you want to keep that separate from the house. So if the house burns down, um, you'll still have that coverage. And then keep your credit score high. So let's finish with, so what strategy should you have? What should, how about students and young marriage? What strategy should you guys have right now? Isaac, what, what have you been thinking about today as we've talked? Um, making sure that the, the liability portion of your auto and renters yeah. insurance is big enough that it really doesn't make your monthly payment that much, that much more. Like four Diet Cokes a week and you can, you can increase it by 10 bucks. Here's just some thoughts. Keep your credit card emergency fund high. Adequate auto insurance, minimum 100, 300, 100. And then get, get renter's insurance. Again, renter's insurance is really cheap. If you get it from the same company that does your auto insurance, it's generally really cheap. Anyone here make money on their renter's insurance? Okay. So see that it actually does happen. And again, as your emergency fund grows, increase your deductible. Uh, we wouldn't do our deductible of $1,000, but it was $750 because I think if I went, when I went from $750 to $1,000, it only deducted, you know, I only saved a dollar every six months. So $250 divided by two, so it would take me 125 years to make up that one. Um, how about married with families? What are some of the changes here? You guys are all tired. You're saying, hey, I only got five minutes left. <laughs> Yeah, make sure you have it. Here. You will need it. <laughs> you know, you might raise your split coverage too if, when you have teenage drivers. Make sure your teenage drivers keep the... We actually, uh, my, my whole city had to get their roofs replaced because uh -huh. there was a hill storm um, a year ago, August. Uh -huh. And they were like golf ball size hills. It, it ruined all the roofs in the whole city. So, you know, you, get, you think, oh, I'll never use it, but... Yeah. So everything hit at once. Our insurance is, yeah, everything. 
st stay ticket free. Actually, I'd probably, th I'd probably go try an HO5 coverage. Reduce your home things. Again, guaranteed full replacement. And then as your kids, as your t you got teenage kids, you might even consider, and your asset size grows, you might consider a uh, umbrella policy. Yeah, they dropped the umbrella policy. Yeah. But an umbrella policy is good. Yeah. Because, you know, when you start having assets. Yeah. How about empty nesters? People like me. So here's just some thoughts here. So, I, you know, I want to make sure I still, because the toys now are instead of for my kids, they're for the grandkids. Are there, is there still equal liability there? Carlos knows, yeah. So we just need to t take into account toys used for kids and grandkids in considering insurance. And again, things like that. Just So m my point here in our discussions here was really the nice thing about insurance was once you get it set in place, it's not something you have to review a lot often. So once I uh, set my auto and my uh, auto and my uh, homeowner slash renter's insurance in place, I'll review it about once every two to three years, just to make sure my coverage is up. But it's not something that I review every week or every month. But the key is you get it right the first time. Ethan, when you review it every few years, do you like shop around for yeah. better rates and things like that? Yeah. And realize I'm not the smartest one because my brother sold me the insurance and so I just went with him for the last 15 <laughs> years. <laughs> now that he's retired, <laughs> we'll get serious about this. Um, kind of along that, would you recommend like, like shopping for insurance based on a specific insurance agent that like, you like and trust or, would you, or like based on, on like the old like the company name? I would do companies and I would check the A and best ratings and I'd probably put a level that I wouldn't go below. So as long as I can get the insurance, AM Best, go to ambest.com and, and they rate the different insurance companies. Okay, cool. takeaways. Okay. Did you guys hear about the accident this morning? Pardon me? Did you just hear about the accident this morning? Oh, uh, what happened? So up in Centerville, about, it was like 6.45 or 6.50 this morning, the, a, a guy, I don't know what happened, but he went off the freeway through a fence and landed on the railroad tracks. So they called in the dispatch, and there was a dispatcher that was in the area. So he he went he got over there pretty quick, but he ran up, and the guy was unconscious, pulled him out seconds before the train. I don't know if it's on video and you can tell, but yeah. it just it's just crazy. But okay. Anyway, so I wonder what okay. Takeaways? Yeah, Daniel. Your yeah, get your renter's insurance from your auto insurance. Trey. And that was my big one too, but also the the liabilities thing, not mm -hmm. reducing your liabilities too much. Yeah, don't you reduce your liabilities. Re your reduce other things. Yeah. Robert. Uh, consider renter's insurance. Yeah, consider renter's insurance. Jessica, you get to be the last one. Get guaranteed full replacement costs. So here's my takeaways for today. Number one, insurance is necessary, but we should be wise insurance consumers. Every dollar we save is a dollar less, or a dollar more, less we have to earn to accomplish our goals. Number two, get rent renter's insurance so, so cheap. The reduction in costs from your auto policy could make it really cheap. Or if you're like Ben, you, uh, uh. Tyler. Pardon me? Tyler. Tyler. <laughs> Tyler, you actually, Tyler, well, you actually make money. And number three, the purpose of insurance is to help us do what we could not do with our own assets. The purpose of a savior is to help us do the same, but with our own efforts. Thanks, everyone. We will see you on, on Monday.